So again, welcome, and I just want to read a little introduction on Dave. Dave Barry, our speaker tonight, is an information technology and program management executive with over 30 years experience in consulting management, operations, and trouble program recovery. During his career, he has analyzed situations, identified problems, proposed alternatives, and resolved situations for international companies and service <coughs> industries. He has a unique ability to identify and capitalize on opportunities for organizational change and operational improvement. Dave has managed to help of multi-billion dollar program portfolios, having worked in over 20 countries and five countries, and on five continents. Dave is Managing Director of Abyss Program Management, LLC, a global program management consultant practice. Now, you have a responsibility too. Things that you put in your list of assumptions, they need to be things that you really believe are true. They have to be things that have a high probability of occurring. If you put low probability events in as assumptions, there was a cartoon strip. It's not, not, not around anymore, but it was, it was called Opus. I don't know if anybody's ever read it or not. But he, they, this character had what was called his nightmare closet. And he sort of stuffed things in the closet. And then at night, when he'd go to sleep, the nightmares would come out. Well, putting low probability or even, even somewhat unlikely assumptions in as assumptions is stuffing things in your nightmare closet when you least expect they're going to come out at you. Service level agreements. Most projects actually have service levels, even if they're not outsourcing type engagements. Um, it may be how quickly you respond to problems during your implementation. It may be how you report your status you're going to have service level expectations. Um, now, one of the things that happens with service levels is people don't really do a good job of looking at it and saying, what's the appropriate service level? What really ties to, my, what does my business really need? You got a client who says, or a sponsor who says, I want these really high service levels without thinking through what's the cost, what's the implication, What's it going to cost me in budget? How long is it going to take to get to reach them? What's the misset expectation going to be if we don't reach them? And then you've got the, the poor project manager who's out there trying to achieve those. He's trying to hold them down low. But you know what? Holding them too low doesn't do any good either. You have to, you have to meet a service level that's appropriate to the business, or you're going to create expectation issues down the stream as well. And one of the big things is, are they attainable? It doesn't do you any good to have a service level that nobody's going to be able to achieve or it's going to take Herculean effort to achieve, especially if it's not required by the business. And you've got to have them documented, just like any other requirement. Now, deliverables. Deliverables is one of my favorite topics because when it comes to documenting scope, I worry less about requirements. I start off with what are the deliverables that I have to, get to produce for the, for the client? Now, deliverables can be many things. It can be a computer system. It can be a remote control. But it can also be a status report, a timesheet, uh, a packing slip. Now, which of those are deliverables? Well, the answer is they can all be deliverables. What does your contract say? What does your commitment to your client say? And the answer is, if your commitment to your client says you have to deliver it to them, it's a deliverable. And one of the things that I, that I always stress to everybody is, if you want to be successful, the first starting point in any project is assemble that complete list of deliverables, no, no matter how minuscule or no, no matter how unimportant. And that is your basis for controlling scope and controlling acceptance. Make sure that your subcontractor deliverables are in there as well, and your client deliverables. How many people in here have had projects where the clients had to deliver something to them? Yeah, right? Who's the, pro who's the person on the project least likely to deliver? The client, right? Get them in the list too. They're treated like everybody else. And make sure they're clearly defined. You got acceptance criteria for them. And those are key. But I also like to see the details of how, that's gonna, how these deliverables are going to be delivered. Who do they go to? What's the mechanism for delivery? 
if it's something you can have copies of, how many copies? What's the format of them? The more prescriptive you can be about a deliverable, when it's due, where it's going, who's going to sign off on it. If you can produce all those things in a list, what you have is an acceptance plan. And the best kind of acceptance plan there is. Yes, you have to have the requirements specified too. But this is actually equally as important. Um, scope control. Everybody knows how important scope control is. And to me, it comes down to managing baselines. And not just requirements, all the baselines. And well, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But run everything through scope control, everything through change control. Even if it doesn't impact cost and schedule. Uh, that's one of the big mistakes that I see. People say, oh, well, there's no impact on cost, there's no impact on schedule, so it's really not a, a change in scope. But what happens is if you don't document those, you've lost control of your contractual baseline. You don't know what you're obligated to deliver anymore. So don't do any work without it. And of course, we talked about verifying scope at kickoff. And then, is there a formal body to approve scope? Do you have one place in the project that is the governing authority that says yes or no to any scope change? I'll get, I'll get to who that is in a minute. So, enough on what it is we're doing. Now let's talk about, is there a meeting of the minds? And this is all about sponsorship, executive committees, change management, stakeholders, and users. So let's talk about a project sponsor. Outside of the project manager, I think this is the most key individual to a successful project. You've got to have somebody on the business side, or what, if it's not a business, then whatever the, the key organizational um, person involved, somebody who's personally vested in this project's success. Somebody who, who, who says, I'm going to make sure this project happens. I'm going to make sure they get what they need. Because no matter how good you are, there are things that as a project manager are outside your control. There are things you can't get for your project. There are political battles you can't fight for yourself. And that's, what, that's where the, the, a sponsor really comes in. They've got to get your funding for you. They've got to get your resources for you that are not available to you within your team. And they've got to speak for the business. They've got to be that overarching voice that speaks for, for the organization. And they're the chair of the executive steering committee. And I say executive steering committee, but there's different levels of projects. There's different sizes. They may not be executive executives, but you've got to have some committee responsible for the, for the, the organization that this project's being delivered to. That, rep that, that represents it, and it's a cross-section of that organization. And the big things are, they've got to be active and they've got to meet. They've really, got to, they've really got to be there. This is who you do your program reviews to, your project reviews to. And they've got to handle escalation management, and they've got to get you what you need. And don't be afraid to escalate. Don't be afraid to ask. I guess that's the big message here. Make them, make them hold the meetings. Don't be afraid to ask for what you need. These are people who can go fight your political battles for you. And they're the ones when you say, I don't know what the requirements are. I can't get a decision. This is the place you go to and say, I've got to have a decision. I've got to know which way we're going. All right, expectation management. This is the business we're in. It doesn't matter what else you do. It doesn't matter what schedule you met, what budget you met, what requirement you delivered. If you failed to meet your sponsors and your, and your stakeholders' expectations, you failed. The flip side is, you could have actually done a somewhat mediocre job managing and running the project, but you met the expectations of those stakeholders. You're a hero. And that's, that's the fact of it. Now, you are either going to manage your expectations or somebody else is. 
And let me tell you a secret about that somebody else. They don't have the same goals and desires you do, and they don't have your best interest at heart. So go set the expectations yourself. Start right away, and there's a lot of stakeholders out there on most projects. So you gotta, you gotta work them all, and keep doing it all the way through the project. Now, when those stakeholders are out there, you've also got to work on building consensus among them. Because even though they're going to say, oh yes, we're all here together, it's one big happy family, we all know that it's not. These people have different viewpoints, different priorities. Some of them are all in engaged in the project. Some of them are sitting back waiting to see what's happening. Um, some of them will invest anything it takes. Some of them won't invest anything. Some people in your stakeholder environment have everything to win and nothing to lose. Some of them have nothing to gain and everything to lose. And that has a huge impact on, the, on their behavior. So, and they're not all the same. What, is the, what was the old uh, author's expression? All pigs are created equal, but some pigs are more equal than others. The same thing is true with stakeholders. And you'll figure out the important ones. But you, you can't please everybody all the time. But you have to try. It's the Gordian knot. You have to keep trying. OK, end users, the people who are really going to use whatever it is you're building and delivering. You have to get them involved. Next to the sponsor, they're your most important stakeholder. Um, you, whatever you're doing has to meet the need that, that lets them solve the, the, the company or the, or the organization's end goals and needs. So they've got to be involved. They've got to be involved up front in the requirements, and they've got to be involved in the acceptance of it. And they've got to be involved in the change management process that you're deploying. Management of change. It can be as big as the overall project. That may sound strange, but there's a lot of work that goes on to getting these things accepted, to do the organizational change, the business processes, the training, sometimes restaffing. Your clients, you can help them, but your clients got to be vested. They've got to be involved. You can help do pieces of it, but they've got to own responsibility. So how's it governed? How are you actually going to manage the thing? Not, I'm not talking about the individual processes. I'm talking about the general management of a project. How are you going to structure it, roles and responsibility, communications? How are you going to review it? So the first thing is, and this may sound silly, but going in on these pr troubled projects, is there an organization chart that shows who's responsible for what? And does anybody have one in their possession? And do they know what, understand it? Are they familiar with it? I've gone into projects where I've seen every combination you could imagine. Four different people pull out org charts, and it's four different versions, and none of them match. Some people don't have them, and everybody has a different opinion on the way it works. But the big thing is you've got one. Everybody's involved. Clients are involved. Subcontractors are involved and identified. And everybody understands it. There's no magic organizational structure. That's not usually how people get in trouble. It's that people don't know. And the same thing is true with roles and responsibilities. You've got to have them defined, and people have to know what they are. Those are the two keys. Yes, you need to have no overlaps, and you need to have no gaps in, in the roles and responsibilities. But you know what? If you've got them defined, and people understand what they are, your team will fix those things for you. They'll find them, they'll point them out, they'll help you resolve them. But you also have to include everybody. Customers, subcontractors, support people. It's got to be the extended team when you do these things. Communications. Um, I think the big thing here is that you have to, you have to plan for it and do it. Um, 
There's lots of stakeholders you have to communicate with and you have to take them all into account. And you have to think about the messages that you're putting out. Not everybody needs all the same information. And there's, there's such a thing as communicating too much and there's such a thing as communicating too little and it's not the same for everybody. So you do have to sit down and think about for the different groups what it is they need to know and when they need to know it. And it, it just takes time to sit down and think through that and then put together the plan of how you're going to communicate to them and what channels you're going to use. Now, this is one of my big points right here. On any project, I don't care what kind of thing you're doing, there are going to be points in time where there's what I, I you, you can call them gateways, you can call them phase reviews, but there are points where you come together where you've perhaps completed requirements or there's some design process going on. Every project has them. Every life cycle for a project has these points there. Now, what people do is they get behind and they get under pressure. They say, gosh, we're not really ready to move to the next phase yet, but the schedule says we have to go. Now, are you going to the next phase because you're ready? Or are you going because the schedule says you're ready? And if you're going because the schedule says you're ready, you've gotten the shovel out and you've started digging the hole. Um, people do it with the best interest of, of the project in mind. Uh, a lot of project managers have been in other roles. They've been engineers, they've been finance people, so forth. And they've done great all their, all their career. And they're good people. And they think, you know, if I just have a little more time, I can fix this. So I'm not going to raise the issues. We're going to go ahead and call it the next phase, and we're going to move on. And we're going to fix it. And we're just not going to bother everybody with the details, but we're going to get it taken care of. Now, what happens? Well, first, you're moving forward with quality issues. You're building that next phase not on bedrock, but you're building it on sand and gravel. And that means that there's going to be rework involved. Now, there's some general rules of thumb around that. If you take a normal cycle like requirements, top level design, detail design, if it's a software job or some other job, so there's an assembly phase and a testing phase. Every time you move from one of those phases to the next, what costs you a dollar during requirements is going to cost you $10 during design. And every time you move a phase through another phase gateway without correcting it, it's going to be another order of magnitude and cost. It's a geometric progression. Now, you can argue whether is it exactly 10, is it 8, is it 12? Okay, but I, I guarantee you it's a geometric progression. So this snowballs on you. And you think you're behind schedule, so you're going to catch up. But what happens is you're now trying to catch up at the same time you're doing rework. And rework piles on top of rework. And this is how projects get really behind schedule. People think they're getting ahead of schedule. What's really happening is they're building an enormous backlog that's, that's build, building up behind them, and it's like a tidal wave building behind them. Okay, project reviews are part of governance. Project reviews are how we keep ourselves honest. Most of the time in project reviews, I go in and do a review of a project. I'm not really telling people things they don't already know. They know where the problems are, but what? A reviewer says it, and people listen. The project manager says, we've got to have X, Y, Z, and people go, oh, yeah, 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 the project manager's always asking for this or that or the other. But you do reviews, and you have a forum where people are actually taking the time to talk about it and taking the time to look at it. And that makes a difference. Doing the review, even though people may already sort of know what's going on, going through the process makes a difference. It helps communicate, it helps build consensus, 
and it makes a difference. So you have to do them. You have to do them with the subcontractors. You have to involve the client. You should do them as a consolidated team. You shouldn't be doing a review here, a review here, a review here. You ought to be doing a consolidated review. And yes, you ought to be doing, looking at all aspects of the projects, the risks, the issues, the schedules, the budgets. It ought to, it ought to be an all-encompassing review. So then we move on to how do you get these things done? What are the processes? You know, where, where do you really get in trouble? Now, you look at that list, there's no rocket science there, right? It's all the same the things we've learned about. It's the processes we read about. It's the classes we take. There's nothing magic there. So looking at startup, one of the first things I look about, I, I, I'm going back to the kickoff meeting again, right? Was there one? Did you, did you do an effective kickoff meeting? Did the kickoff meeting include everybody? Or did you do two or three kickoff meetings? I can tell you right now the answer is do one. Get your, cli get your client or sponsor in there, get your subcontractors in there, get, get sp support people in there, get your finance people in there. Get everybody you can associated with the project in the room for the kickoff. Do that scope verification. That project organization chart nobody understood. But you get everybody in the room and you explain it one time. Go through those roles and responsibilities. Takes a little time, pays off downstream. Um, one of my hot points is to have a project handbook. Nothing magical about a project handbook. Put the information in there so that if somebody new comes onto the project, think about the questions they're going to ask when they come on board. Answer them. Even the little ones, the silly ones. Where do I get a password to get onto a system? Where are the bathrooms? Where do I, get, where do I find a copy of the org chart? Where's the, where do I get the schedule? Who's responsible for what? Um, what if I have to work after hours? The silliest little questions. It's amazing the inefficiencies that we build into projects in trying to bring people up to speed when documents like this can cover an enormous percentage of, of those, those, those activities. Um, do you have the critical staff in place? I'm not talking about have everybody's staff, but do you have the critical positions at least at the time you kicked off? And establish that program management office. Now, projects are different sizes, right? Sometimes we're one-man shows. Sometimes we have bigger teams. But you still have to figure out how you're going to accomplish the functions that are going on. How are you going to do financial reporting? How are you going to get the schedule done and maintain it? How are you going to handle management of change? How are you going to handle onboarding staff? How are you going to do time reporting? All those functions that you have to do have to get done, whether you're a one, one-man team or whether there's 30 of you. So you have to figure that out and get it going. Then there's simple infrastructure. Office space. Communications. Does somebody have a PC when they get on board to, to, to work on? Do, do they have access to a network? Um, security. Can they actually gain access to what they need to to do their jobs? Uh, depending on where you're working and where you're bringing people in from, housing and transportation. Um, I was working on a job, a recovery job, for um, Sam's Club at Walmart. And we were bringing a lot of people in from offshore. Guess what? Most of them don't have driver's licenses. You can't just give them a rental car and turn them loose. So it's just, a, it's, it's, it's one more little detail about logistics and, and making sure that they've got, people have what they need. Visas and work permits, travel, travel documents. Um, a lot of times these offshore places change. 
over time. What's easy at one point in time and is good becomes more difficult at another time. One of the biggest problems we had with the offshore work we were doing there with India, and India is a very technological advanced company, was getting the installed bandwidth we needed to be able to communicate to get the work done. And that's not because they don't know how to put bandwidth in. It's because the explosion of the work that's being done over there created a backlog for that kind of work and it took time to get it done. These things change all the time. So you have to anticipate. Okay, budget. I'm going back to, to baselines again. Do you have a performance measurement baseline in place for your budget? You know, was it allocated or did you actually develop a budget? Or did, did somebody just give you the, the numbers or did you actually build a budget that matched your plan for, for doing the job? Is your budget tied to your, to your work breakdown structure and your, and your activities on your schedule? Do you have a contingency reserve for your risks? Is there a management reserve on the project? I can tell you right now, on the projects that are in trouble, almost 100% of the time on those two, the answer is no and no. Are you updating your forecasts for, for what it's going to take you to do the job? On a lot of the projects that are in trouble, you know how they update the forecasts? Anybody want to take a guess? Actual expenses plus the original forecast to, for the remaining work. Got a project that's 50% um, late on schedule and 80% over on budget. What do you think the, the value of those original forecasts for the remaining work is? Terrible, right? But while most of these projects are in trouble, that's what they're using to forecast the remaining work to complete. Why is that? Oh well, no, if they reforecast the remaining work, it's going to look a lot worse, and it already looks terrible, so they don't, right? So is past performance taken into account on your reestimation? And scheduling. Are you using the tools that were taught to do the schedules? It's, it comes down as simple as that. Is the team actually using the schedule to manage the project? Do you walk into somebody's office and say, let me see your schedule? And they pull it out and they pick it up and they go, <laughs> and blow the dust off of it. And they say, yes, it's right here. Or are they actively managing it with the, with the scheduling tools? Is it updated regularly? Um, does the schedule include client activities? Does it include contractor activities? Are the dependencies between these people tied in at all? That's, that's one of the big ones I look for. I'm less concerned about whether the schedules are actually tied into a master schedule than I am that the dependencies show up between them. Risk management. On the troubled projects, the two things I look for first are, do you have a risk log? And is there anything in it? That sounds terrible, but that's actually the norm for, for what I experience. Now, I'm really looking for, if you've actually got risks, are they, are they even being updated? That's the next level. But what I'm really looking for, on, on, what I want to see is, do you actually have risks? Do you have impacts and probabilities analyzed for them? Are you looking at them in your reviews? Are you doing anything about them? You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, oh, well, you have to do response plans and you have to develop budget reserves for all this stuff. And I got to tell you, the number of projects that I see actually doing that is abysmally low. I'd be happy if I saw people who had a, a, a regular li list updated with their risks and they'd simply impact, you know, they'd analyzed them when they knew what the probability and impact was and they were looking at them on a regular basis. I'd probably give them a B plus if they had that. And the other thing is, most of the time when I see risk analysis, I only see budget. 
I don't see anybody doing anything at all about the schedule. You have a list of 50 items of risk and there's nothing in the schedule. They've taken the activities, linked them together, seen what the shortest critical path is and that's the schedule. Okay. Um, the other thing is, are required resources identified? You know, do you have them? I mean, do you have what you need to run the job? Um, and on troubled projects in particular, that last one right there, I see people working 70, 80 hours a week, turning in 40 hours a week, and it looks like you're spending over the budget, but not too bad. But in reality, you're horrifically overspending the budget. And people are saying, well, it's just the, what we do, it's the way we do the business, it's okay. You know the real problem with that? How do you estimate future projects? Analogous estimating, right? You go back and look at the performance on past projects. What's the basis for that? Everybody worked 40 hours and that's what was recorded, so how long did those tasks take? So you're going to keep estimating based on what you recorded and, you're and so you're already digging holes for the future projects. Now, baselines, staying out of trouble for me, one of, the, one of the, the, the really big ones is baselines. And I'm talking about maintaining baselines for everything. Everything. Technical information, equipment that you've got, configurations, schedules, budgets, data, test data, test results, everything and doing configuration management against it, revision control. You do this and you know where you are. You don't know where you are, all the scheduling and, and tracking and everything else in the world won't help you if you don't know where you are. And not maintaining baselines will just kill you. So, configuration management plan. Do you have one and is it being followed? In software projects or any technology projects in particular, one of the first things I look for if they're, if they're down in, in the area where they're building things in particular, one of the first things I look at is defect tracking. And I, I want to see the graphs of their defects. I want to see the rate of their opening and the rate they're closing. And I can take one look at the curves and see what's going on. Because a troubled project, they're ramping up and they're not closing. Or they ramp up, they drop off, and then they pop back up again. And that's because they're not doing configuration management. And problems go away and they come back. And new ones come in and you'll see a new version come out and all of a sudden it has way more problems than it did before they put the new version out. Baseline management, configuration control. I'll tell you a secret, when you see that happen, there's only one action I take when I, when I see that happen. I stop work on the project and I direct everyone on the project to put everything back under configuration management. I stop all work until, until all base, baselines are back under configuration management. You know, you know what the team tells me? You're crazy, you're going to kill the project, it's going to take six weeks to do it. It's never taken more than two weeks. And it's always put the projects back on track. Once again, subcontractors, client deliverables, everybody the same. That's a theme you've probably heard to me or from me all night long. Everybody on the project gets treated the same. Everybody's one team. Doesn't matter whether, who, whoever's doing work on the project's the same. Gets treated the same. And then when you get down to testing, um, I look for a hierarchical testing approach. 
It doesn't matter whether it's software or putting chairs together. It doesn't matter. Don't try to tackle the world's problems all at once. Look at your process and, and do testing along the way so that you're not trying to test everything at once. And do defect tracking along with that. One defect tracking system along with that. And that testing approach gets sign off by your client, by your sponsor. And get end users involved with it because People who build things and people who use things test them differently. People who build things test them the way they understand them, which is the way they built them. So they only test them the way they built them. Users test them the way they need to be used. So they're completely different ways of testing. You test it the way it was built and then deploy it, you're going to go down in flames. And another one is rollout planning. Whatever you build, you have to go somehow get it into end users' hands and get it in use. And this gets shortchanged all the time. And the reason is people on projects have most of their experience working on everything that is involved up to this point in time. And people are very good at estimating what they know. And they're terrible at estimating and planning what they're unfamiliar with. So this gets shortchanged again and again and again. Not enough time for it, and the complexity of it gets underestimated. And people think, people have too high a confidence in what they can accomplish. So when you get ready to do this stuff, I, I gotta tell you, Murphy is alive and well. Murphy's Law, right? So you've got to look at doing phased takeovers. Don't try to tackle the world all at one time. Figure out a way to, whatever you're going to do, try to figure out a way to break it up into manageable pieces. Not only because it makes it easier on you, but it contains the risk for whoever's getting it. What, whoever the end organization or business that's getting whatever it is you're, you're delivering. You've got to think in terms of containing the risk for them for them and their customers. So break it up into those pieces so that you can, you can deliver it in a way that you're not going to impact, for instance, their entire customer base at one time or their entire product line that, they're, that, that, that they sell or, what, or whatever, whatever business they're in, that you don't do it all at once. And make sure you've got fallback and recovery plans. If something does go wrong, you know, think about these things ahead of time. And the other secret is you don't go build and deliver the project and then figure out how to do this. This work has to be built into the project because the way you design whatever it is you're doing has to have this in mind when you, when you do it. It has to be integral to the project plans. Because you may have to, if you want to do this, whatever it is you're delivering, you may have to build it differently to facilitate this. So you have to think about this up front, and that's what people don't do. They, they never think about phase deliveries or, or deployment up front and how they're going to do it. You may have to do dual operations. How are you going to do dual operations? How are you going to share data? How are you going to synchronize everything back and forth? And decommissioning, archiving, especially with Sorbanes-Oxley and the rules that they've changed and put in place. Um, you take something today. It used to be you could take something, you could throw it away, get rid of it, burn it, sell it. With t today's rules, you may have a legal requirement at some point in time to have to go back to the original data source and recover data. And that doesn't mean going into your database and saying, we have the data here. You may have a requirement to have to go back and retrieve it using the original method and the original data. So decommissioning sometimes gets complicated. And then my favorite is right here. No big bang. No do it all at once. Go in and just slam something in and shut the old thing down and just go for broke. I was talking to, to David earlier 
the nuclear labs have a, um, everybody has a risk tolerance, right? Risk thresholds that, they, that they're, they're okay with and not okay with. In the nuclear programs, they have a thing that's um, uh, no VLNs. VLNs are very loud noises. Nuclear people don't like those. Well, I'll tell you right now, um, stay away from big bang deployments or big bang solutions to projects because they create very loud noises. So, you go in and you look at these projects. You got the anecdotal knowledge about what's going wrong, the things that have happened in the past. You know what the common problems are. We know the critical problems, right? Assessment can happen quickly. I've walked into clients. I can remember one CIO that I sat down with in Europe. And we had been talking for 10 or 15 minutes. And he says, well, and he was a little skeptical because he was like, what experience do you have in my, in my industry? And I'm like, none. And he was like, well, I'm not sure how you can assess this. He says, well, what do you think is going on here? So I proceeded to describe what I thought his environment was like on his project. And after about five minutes, he's, he was listening. And then I proceeded to go on and I said, now, now this is why I think that's happening. And I proceeded to describe what issues I thought the project was incurring and why it was, why it was in trouble and why it was having difficulties. And he rolled back and leaned back in the chair and he says, why do we need to do the assessment? He says, you just described my project. And I said, no. I described the one and only troubled project. They're all the same. I said, we have to go in and assess your project because yours is different. Some things that we think are bad will actually turn out to be good. And in every one of these areas, there's degrees of doing well and degrees of doing poorly. And we have to understand the degree that your project is doing well or poorly in every one of these areas. And there will be other areas that come up. There will be surprises. When we do an assessment, it will, it will be a process of discovery, and we will discover other things. So we will use that, the, the interviews and, and document reviews and so forth that we do as a process of discovery to learn about your project and learn the specifics of yours. Because it will be different. It will look alike, sound alike, but it will be unique. But because of these similarities, we can still do it. We can do it quickly. So we're going to do these, do these assessments, con compile the findings, generate some recommendations. But then the, the important step. When you're in a bad automobile accident and you go into an emergency room, what the doctors do first is not jump in and treat you. The first thing they do is triage. They figure out sort of what's wrong and they prioritize. Because if you're in bad shape and they try to fix everything wrong with you all at once, they're going to kill you. The same thing is true with projects. If you go into a troubled project and you try to fix everything all at once, you're going to get the shovel out and bury the project. You're going to kill the project. Because that much change, that much correction is, cannot be absorbed all at once. If you have a project that's you know, eight months late, it took them however many months to get there and in trouble. You're not going to correct it in a, in a day or a week or a month. It's going to be a long process of recovery. So you have, to, you have to triage. You have to think in terms of what are the most critical things to fix first. And critical is both a function of what's most important, but also what's most timely. Some things are more important, not because they, they might seem the most critical, but because their, their time horizon is closer. So you have to balance the two together, and you have to come up with a, a time plan. And in the same way I say no big bang on projects, no big bang on recoveries either. You have to map out a phased plan for fixing these things. And you have to think in terms of, you know, what, what can I do first? What can I do second? What can I do third? And, and develop this recovery phases for, for, for a project. And you do have to examine the viability of a project. Because when you get one that's in trouble, time has moved on. So you have to look at the, at the viability. Have the business requirements changed? 
Has confidence been so destroyed that the, that the environment is such that the team can no longer be successful? I've, I've encountered that. I've seen, I've seen cases where uh, I could have gone in and mentored the team and the team could have delivered what, what was needed to be done, but that the client had so little confidence in them that the environment the project was operating in was such that there's no way they could be successful. And my job was actually to convince the client that they needed to do something different than moving forward. Because I knew that failure was imminent because of that. So not every project's recoverable. So you have to then think in terms of, well, what do we do? What's the right answer? Do you just outright kill the project? Do you say, well, the project's not going to complete, but all's not lost. Maybe a partial delivery of the project is useful. Maybe we can go do, do portions of the project and complete it. Or perhaps we say, we're going to restructure this project. We're going to redirect it. We're going to take it on a new path in a different direction and realign it with the business requirements. And we're not going to meet the original requirements and goals because they don't matter anymore. But we're going to realign it. We're going to go meet those new goals. But you have to go through that process. You, ha you have to have that frank examination. And the environment that I worked in for a number of years, I worked for a, for a very large consulting company. And on these jobs, there was a lot of money at stake. And so it was actually sort of a two-step process. I had to take my company through the knothole of what made sense here, which typically meant that we had some sort of a preference of a couple of solutions. And perhaps there might be one or two solutions that were unacceptable. And then I had to go over to the client and say, OK, this, this is what we can do. And, and then I had to get them through the knothole. Because those are processes of, of discovery and evolution to get people through those decision processes. But checklists, checklists and simple, simple recovery sort of evaluations are feasible. They work. And phased recovery plans are what you need. But you have to base it on pragmatic, feasible approaches. You know, what's possible? It's all about the, the, the art of the possible in these, in these cases. <clears throat> Questions? Based on, on your experience uh, looking at projects that have failed, we're going to start at $200,500, $50 million and what? Have you seen the number of projects that have failed and the tendency of a project from the beginning to have problems and failure to cover originates from the bidding process, the proposal stage. Many times, and yes. Ending up in the contract mm -hmm. by the sales, marketing department, and those are then selling over the points to the project management department to get something they have never seen before. Have you seen the, the relationship of projects that do have problems from the outset because the project manager has not evolved from the beginning? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you, 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 earlier in the presentation, I asked the question, was the budget built up and analyzed and derived, or was it just simply provided, right? And that's one of the pl places where that comes from, where you have a, a proposal, perhaps, that's put together, and there was never really a development of the schedule. Uh, the client provides a schedule, and that schedule is accepted. There was never any schedule analysis done to see if it's feasible. And they, the bid was based more on competitive uh, pressures and the client's budget than it was on what they thought it was going to take to do the job. Now, um, in those situations, it's still possible to put together a project that can be successful, but not if you simply just acquiesce to everything and go bid it. Um, but if you, have a, if you have an approach during a proposal that says, we have these issues, there are definitely tactics to enable you to go bid competitively and produce a project that can be successful, but not if you just acquiesce to everything that's asked for and throw it over the fence to the project manager. So yes, that is a common theme that I've seen. You bet.
I wanted to ask you about engaging end users. I, mean, that's, I often see that they're just completely overlooked in projects. Um, I believe a lot of my background has been in the IT type type of projects. So when I engage end users, it's from uh, several several different viewpoints. One is validating if if they weren't involved in the, in the requirements initially, then validating the requirements, and then in the process of translating requirements into design, validating that design at least at a high level, and in particular what things are going to look like. Um, look and feel of, of man-machine interfaces, displays, and so forth, um, because that's where I think users really start to understand requirements. I think it's very difficult for them to read requirements documents and really perceive what's wrong with them. It's hard for them to say, oh, this is missing, or no, I don't need that, or that, that requirement's wrong. I think it's very difficult for them. So. Um, I've always believed strongly in an approach of um, sort of, um, uh, if you will, a rapid prototyping that allows you to put some sort of a framework up and get something in front of them that they can see and touch. And that enables them to say, oh, okay, yeah, 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 that's good, or no, that's terrible, or where's this? Where's this process? Uh, the other area that getting them involved in is talking to them about their jobs. Take me through a day in the life of your job, those sorts of discussions as opposed to talking to them about system requirements or, or computer systems or whatever. Take me through your job. Show me how you do your job with an analyst sitting beside them. I, I think is very powerful in, in engaging them and, and helping in that space. And then the, the final piece is engaging them in testing. Even if they don't necessarily know how to write test procedures, even if they're utilizing your test procedures, getting them involved early before you start deploying, getting them involved in the test process, um, they'll, they'll still at least surface the issues. Even if they didn't write the test procedures, the process of going through them, sitting in front of a system, um, will enable them to say, oh, uh, that won't work. I, I have to be able to do X, Y, Z. They'll find missing problems. They'll say, no, this, this doesn't support the business process, or whatever the case may be. It, engaging them will do that. that. That's later than you want. But it's better than when you when you think you've got sign off and you're out trying to de to deploy. Does that answer your question? You. Okay. Yes. Um, our biggest problem is this is across pretty much every technology project or program that we have in my business unit is there's all these like different projects they all intermingle and I run a program that literally either fingers into almost all of them or they kind of feedback in me so mm -hmm. I take the brunt of all these people not ever wanting anything. I like your comment about bring everybody under change management. Sometimes you just have to say stop and get everybody to understand that you can't just have work in these little silos anymore because it just destroys almost everything we do half the time. Project fails and everybody starts explaining everything and I'm like, uh, do you even notice you aren't looking at the big picture? <laughs> like, um, you know, they come, like I get, sometimes I get requirements from a project, another project, two weeks before I'm supposed to deliver to that point, I'm supposed to say, I'm like, it's never going to happen. Um, so, there's, there's a couple of things what's that... What's the best way to do that? So yeah. stop. Well, well, first of all, there's a couple of things. One is, when you start doing baseline control, a component of that is release management. So actually having a plan for release management where you can map out and say, we have the, these, these different projects coming together. And you can do some fairly simple maps where you simply line them up next to each other and you map out revision, versions of them, versioning, right? And you have to map out connection points where they connect together in time. And along with that, because of the nature of, of delivering something, you're going to have to have a time period in which you freeze requirements. So there's sort of a blackout period. And you, you can use graphs like that to help communicate that you know, during this period, this particular project is going to have to have a freeze. They're not going to be able to accept any changes from you. They're not going to be able to do anything to accommodate you because they've got to stop. They've got to finish accommodating change, get built, get this release out. Now, in their next release, they'll be able to accommodate you. So, and, and what you've got to do is you've got to line these different projects up, map out their phases, and say, you know, 
requirements don't flow back and forth every day. That's the one thing you don't want to do. You don't want to say, it's an open door, sure, bring your requirements in, we'll take them, we'll take them, we'll take them, we'll take them. What you want to do is have discrete points at which each project syncs up with the other projects, where the information and the requirements flow in and the baselines resync. Am I making sense there? Yeah, and, and that's really what I've been trying to do. I mean, literally, I've gone as far as calling my boss and being like, we're just not going to do it. I mean, and, and unfortunately, then this is what happens. He goes back to the person and says, we can't do it. We're in a blackout. That person goes like this. Up another couple of levels, and then it comes back down. No, you're gonna do it. So I end up, you know, I mean, literally, I'm only agile because I get all my requirements due at the same time. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm the most agile team there is. Literally, I can get requirements in two weeks from now, I can deliver to you because my people can work overtime. We're all on salary. You just work till it's done. I mean, that's, I go to my developers and I'm like, you have two days. They're like, I need five. I'm like, I'm sorry, this is like Star Trek. You have two days. <laughs> I have to test by Wednesday, so sorry. Well, you might, you might sit down and, and um, but do you understand what I'm saying about, about lining up all the different projects, mapping out major phases, not very discrete. I'm not talking about any involved Microsoft project plan or anything. I'm talking about just major phase lines with dates and saying, you know, we'll accept, we'll have, we'll have major, connection, major connection points that these, these, these different projects feed and connect each other, and then mapping out and saying freeze dates. Draw, draw a picture for your boss and take it to your boss and say, you know, if we can do this, we can save money, accelerate schedule, and, and improve the, the quality of what's being put out. And that's buy-in. Well, yeah. And You're that's what I'm working on shit. right now. I'm, I'm putting together this whole plan for, like, all of 2013, really, because it, it's gotten so crazy that literally in the last six months, I've done, like, seven releases all in three weeks or less. I mean, my, my team, I have 60 people on my team, and they are stressed out. I mean, you know, I have three developers out of that 60 people. <laughs> Literally, sometimes I'm online, you know, all the time. I see emails from them at 3 in the morning. Thankfully, one is overseas, two are over here. But literally, i got to work in 24-7. I mean, it's, it's gotten to the point where I've, I've come, like, this has been really helpful because I've taken notes and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to have to do it. It just yeah. can't happen any longer. <laughs> I actually developed this approach many years ago because I, I was running a project that um, um, it was a government project and it was real-time command and control sort of stuff and it was a huge system back for back then especially it was sort of several million lines of, of code but it was all real-time real-time stuff not no no fancy displays and so forth it was mostly mostly uh, a lot of firmware a lot of all, all real-time stuff and we had to respond to real-world events so we had to put out a major release every six months on the system, which meant that we had to have typically four projects running, four, four different projects running at one time. You know, one would be doing, you know, sort of requirements, another one was in top level design, another was in doing detailed stuff, another coding, another doing testing integration and deployment, and then a team out doing, doing maintenance releases all at the same time. And it was, it was just insane. And, and the reliability on the system was one of these things where the system could not go down. It was one of those environments. And so we, we developed these sort of techniques to do that. And we found that we actually accelerated schedule by doing this. We accelerated schedule and we accelerated quality by doing it. And that's, like the schedule, I mean, I can accelerate the schedule, obviously. It's the quality that I, I mean, I, I cannot deliver quality a lot of times. So we end up delivering stuff and then somebody's like, oh, I forgot a requirement. Exactly what I was going to say. You can't do that. Like, yeah. And that's what's because important. Because now today. it's not an exception, it's the rule. And so why would they? Yeah. champions and they all are like, they all compete. Yeah. And then they all are like, they try to outdo each other. So I need like one champion. That's my other thing, too. Okay. Okay. Once you have that, yeah. solve all the rest of those problems because then <laughs> they'll dictate the priorities. Like, I have sponsors that literally will fight on calls with each other. No, I get this. No, I get this. And I'm like, then they're, they work yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who wants to fight? 
<laughs> or you need somebody one level above them that yeah. it totally <laughs> owns the outcome of all four projects. It's probably going to be two. <laughs> two. Uh, two. Usually it's two. It's not usually one. It's two. I don't work in the IT industry, but um, I've done a number of projects. And uh, somebody a long time ago once told me that a deck has a lot of a lot of fathers, but a bad project isn't working. So when you have an orphan project and you go through, you know, you're doing the, you and the team is doing the best you can to make this project into something viable to start with, and then make take some success out of it. What do you do after the project is over? Because you've got people that you've left scarred, uh, that that are, uh, you know, they're Hope damaged they're the goods. <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> the organization is truly damaged, not through the fault of the people that are there. But either the fault of the way the job was bid, the fault of the planning that went into it. But you need to return that organization back to something that, that makes them feel like they're not worthless. How do you do that? That's a hard one. <laughs> I, no doubt. No big banks. Um, no big banks. You can't throw a party, okay? <laughs> Throwing a party just makes it seem like you're you're Depends on how much alcohol you have. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, they don't come away kind of private. So. <laughs> they, they don't come away healed. They just—it's just like you're you're throwing a bone to them. Here we're gonna have this party. We lost uh, half a million dollars on this, and uh, you know. But thank God it's over. The customers never gonna do our job again. They're never gonna hire us again. But you know, here let's go all get drunk. I mean, that doesn't um, work. Good to this me. may sound silly, but <laughs> did you do morning. did you do a post project review? Right. Because sometimes I think that um, when you do a post-project review, it can be sort of like therapy sometimes. People can, they can get things out that they haven't. And they can talk about the things that bothered them. They can talk about the things that went wrong in the project. But it's also an opportunity to talk about what went right. Because I've yet to find a project that there weren't things that went right in. And one of, the, one of the things that I do when I do an assessment, and one of the things I tell people is, if you go in and you do an assessment, and you meticulously evaluate a project, and you tell them everything that's wrong and what, everything they need to do to fix it, you failed. You have to tell them everything they did right as well. You have to, get, you have to give them a balance in their feedback. And even in the worst project, there are things that were done well and things that people excelled at. Even though the project overall may have done poorly, there, there were successes. And I think that uh, in this case, you've got limited opportunities, but I think a post-project review where you sit down and go through that and take it upon yourself to, to, to point out those successes and make sure that the assessment is balanced. And yes, there's things that went wrong. Be honest about them. They, they, know the, they know those things went wrong. They're, they're not stupid people. They know it. And that's okay. But you know, even, even talking about the things that went wrong um, gives them an opportunity to do a little venting. And, and there's some therapy in that. I mean, there's, no magic ant there's no magic bullet for that. Um, getting them involved in another project that has a sponsor and goes a little smoother is good. I was going to say happy hour after the project review is over. Happy hour after the project review is over. Happy hour after the project review is over. Oh, and include gifts. Gifts are good. I, I just wanted to follow up on, on this question. It's true. I, I believe that you know, success is success of many parents and failure as an orphan. There's uh, many, many uh, uh, board executives who worked on the Edsel project also worked on the last project. On what project? Edsel. The Edsel. So you said they worked on the Edsel and something like that. All the famous board executives would tell you that they worked on the Mustang Metal. Oh, sure. Okay, I can imagine. But my question is, is, do you think we learn more from failure or from success? Failure. So we don't really often know why we succeeded. Can't put Well, I think that, I think when we succeed, I think people are so euphoric and happy in their success that I don't think there's the level of um, examination of what happened. 
So if you don't critically examine what you did, then you're not going to learn from it. And I think we critically examine our failures. We don't critically examine our successes. The flow of success outweighs the, uh, the feeling of failure, so you kind of let that go. <laughs> and even if you're successful, like everybody's like, but you get out great deployments and stuff that are, you know, most times successful. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean I want one two weeks from now. I mean, like, they just, they think that because you can do it and do it right, they can just keep on. I mean, that's, they don't look and go, okay, this was really risky because we did not do this the right way. But they don't allow you to go back and go, okay, well, there were negatives. Like, there's some negatives. It was great. No. <laughs> One time it blows up. Yeah. Then they'll spend the time to evaluate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Planning time. I mean, like, do you have a spreadsheet that shows all your resources when they're available? And oh, yeah, I have one. Would you share No, when they're a oh, oh, yeah. They don't pay for it. <laughs> Like literally, I could do an email right now that says, "I know you're on vacation the rest of the week, but we need you to go home more tonight." <laughs> I mean, like they, there's no, it, it's all, no one pre-plans anything. That's our biggest problem. Uh, so an executive level oh, change needs to You still need your champion. I think that there's another dimension to all of these issues that hasn't been discussed too much <laughs> yet, and that is every project team is a mix of people. And those people generally are at different levels in terms of their experience, their knowledge in project management. And we're all on a path where we're learning. None of us are perfect project managers. None of us have, none of us have managed this project before exactly like this. So there's a lot of risk in every project. And, and so I think that there's a natural set of human issues associated with project success and failure. For example, you talk about some of these fundamental processes like stage gate reviews or project governance or having a project sponsor or stakeholder management or communication planning. But what if the people running the project don't know what a project sponsor is or what a project communication plan is supposed to look like? Or what do you do with a risk management plan after you do one? How do you, how do you use it? So I've, I've seen projects lately in organizations that I would expect really mature project management where it didn't exist. So you have maybe a few people that understand or have some experience in project management, but much of the team are really good technical experts, or they're really good at, with technical backgrounds, but they've never done a critical path schedule, they've never done a risk management plan, they've never integrated cost and schedule in a baseline, they really don't know how to use a baseline or do earn value reporting or a lot of the things that some of us take for granted. So, and then there's the organizational maturity associated with project management. So you have a lot of senior executives telling people what to do when they don't know what they're supposed to tell them what to do. You know, so there are a lot of sort of people and organizational issues that come into play too, I think. Can you just summarize my whole problem? <laughs> I mean, because I'm a BA on other projects. So that's what's horrible. I'm a program manager that goes and sits on other project teams. And I one day, I got assigned to a project, and we were about to deploy that I was replacing a BA that got pulled. And I'm like, what's the, what's the rollback plan if the deployment doesn't work? They're like, what do you mean? And that's, the, that's what the project manager asked me. What do you mean, rollback plan? Well, if the deployment doesn't work, how are we going to get back to where we were? He goes, oh, we're not going to worry about that. I go, well, no, I'm worried about it. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you didn't get to, I mean, we deployed in a week. <laughs> and literally, we, we went, we didn't have a recovery plan until 24 hours before we deployed. So I think it's part of the process is. <laughs> And he's a PMP too, so that's what's so funny. Is I was like, you know, he didn't have a scope either, which kind of bugged me. But like, so, so one one questioner, I think part of the process is, how do we assess where we are in this uh, in this maturing process? You know, what where are our strengths and where are our weaknesses? How much do we as an organization understand about doing things the right way or perfectly or? You know, according to the PM book, and and then looking at maybe some of our successes and failures as a natural 
result of where we are in that maturing process. Uh, anyway, I've seen, yeah. you know, you go into an organization and depending on where they are in the maturity level, either as individuals or as an organization, you can, as you say, anticipate which problems they've got because an immature organization is not going to know about a lot of these fundamental things or how important they are or what the sequence is. So I just thought I'd throw out that human dimension, which I've seen come, come into play a lot. I just sent you a book review on the complexity models um, assessment for program management. That book is amazing. It has assessment tools in there for the organization, for the project manager, and for the persons considering to join the project team. And as on a CD, you just take the different um, assessment tools and you can transport it around the organization. It's an excellent resource to use for that. Do any of y'all that are part of PMOs, I mean, I work outside the PMO, but I, I work with them because we actually have a PMO in our, do any of y'all have PMOs that actually review like the overall structure of the PMO, like to make sure that as a PMO, everybody's kind of doing everything, at least, you know, like, I've actually had people, I've asked for business requirements, they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, where are your business requirements? So I can review them. We don't have a, like, we have like a napkin. I mean, just stuff like that. Do we need to do that? Because our PMO doesn't, and I've suggested that we all try to get on the same page somehow. And they're like, oh, well, you know, you, you manage a program. Okay, so I'm not important, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that's kind of how they do it. All the programs sit outside the PMO. Like, most of the program managers aren't in PMO itself. We're all, like, outside technology people and stuff like that. I'm on a PMO, and uh, at the beginning of each year, we uh, set our goals and objectives for the year, and at the end, or we review those quarterly and update them accordingly. So we do have that, and our PMO is actually comprised of a group of active project managers who have other projects they're managing. So sort of a yeah, they all have projects. But, um, so all run very different. But yeah, we do, and we try to align. We, we basically look at the company's high level goals and objectives, and we have to base ours the line on that. Okay. Well, I think, I think to uh, I think to a large extent, the success or failure of the project is to a large extent also based on the, the culture that is imposed from the top down in, in the sense of if project management is not understood by the executive level downwards up to the PR model level as to the value of project management and the risks and risk management, if there is not a confidence level top down, bottom up, from the program manager up, it transcends down what is going to happen at the lower levels in the project. So my experience has been, and I've been very fortunate in my career in the last 15 years before I retired, that from the CEO down, everybody was involved in my projects. But involved in a sense, in once a month, in a review, and then was something else. If I saw something going possibly to show up as a red flag on the customer side, which always can happen, like my famous blood drunk driver who punched down a policeman and left and was arrested and that truck sits somewhere on their parking lot and nobody knows where the truck is. So I said, you know, this, this kind of thing. You hear that and you go to the CEO and says, by the way, in case you get a phone call about this, here's what happened. It goes this way as well as him coming down to me directly, not to my boss or boss's boss, saying, here's what I heard, can you check that out? That's the kind of cohesion of the support of management to the project. And that transcends to a large extent of my experience also in the failure or the capability of the project to succeed. Well, I agree. I mean, I've, I'm working on a presentation right now for a client where I'm helping them elevate their abilities. And one of the, one of the topics in there is, is creating an environment to enable project managers to be successful is one of the, is one of the topics in the presentation, so I, I would agree with that. Um, I want to go back to a point that you, you made, too, where you're, you're a BA and they just anointed you and made you a project manager one day. Actually, I inherited, a, I inherited the program from my boss when he got promoted. He was the program manager and I was managing right. him a smaller project and working on that project with him and then it became a program and he's like, 
Merry Christmas, because no one wanted it. Like literally, it, it's our CRM, our client relationship management software, and it's so it's so old. It's a very historical product. We're about to change it, so nobody wants to be on the change side because no one wants anything that big. And then everybody's like, oh, it's just so old. It just does itself. Well, it, it really does. My team is very mature. And that's what kind of annoys my entire team about everybody around us. Like, we, we always have a project schedule. We always have checklists. We always know the risks. We always have the plans. And everybody around us is like, you know, we go to their project meetings. And they're like, oh, we just heard about the next season of our plans. And we're like, what do you think? <laughs> Where's you why they're coming two weeks beforehand asking you to change something? Like, I mean, like, I, I, I get questions like, I went, where are the requirements? What are requirements? What's a scope document? I asked a project manager for a project schedule. They're like, what's that? I'm like, so what are they doing? He has a project schedule in Word. Word? Word? Yes. <laughs> These might as well have an environment. environment. <laughs> that way you can show it there. I've seen that. So I come in, like my, my, my boss and I, where he, he was with oh, PM, you know, we, we've all been doing it. I actually moved to be a BA because I like doing the technical. What is a BA? Business analyst. Okay, sorry. Um, and I do support too. So I support a lot of our technology and do setups and configurations and stuff. But I, I inherited this program and I'm like an anomaly. Like, it's weird. I mean, like, I feel, I mean, why aren't I in the PMO? I'm doing all the steps and I mean, I have all the documents. And I, you know. But if you well, want to be in the PMO, you need to talk to your champion and get you in this. No, I don't really want to. <laughs> but if that's how they run projects, no, I wouldn't want to be in that PMO. No, but maybe she I could, in fact, change when she's inside the PMO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think somebody touched on the executive down problem. Yeah. <laughs> I was just saying, you, you've got issues. I mean, because I have an executive of the PMO who allows her PMs to run their project like this. I don't want to be a part of it, really. Well, one of, one of the points I wanted to make is that I've, a, a pattern that I have seen, and I think it goes to some of what you're, you were talking about, is that um, there is a pattern where people see somebody doing really well as part of a project, whether they're a technical person or a BA or a finance person, and they go, well, this person is great. They'll make a wonderful project manager, and they just anoint them, and they become the project manager. And, and that can, and that, now you seem like you're doing pretty well, but I mean, for a lot of people, that's, that's a really good way to ruin a good technical person or a good financial analyst or a good BA a lot of times. That was the corporate trainer of this product, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> oh, and I, I was a rep. I actually used to use it in our service. So, yeah. We've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Yeah. Oh, we have the school we're going to present. We're going to oh, you. well, thank you very much. Thank you. This is a great presentation. And I love the little piece about the nightmare closet. That's great. <laughs> that's, that's my takeaway for sure, among many others. Thanks.